In the last month, I've been asked four times why we aren't weaning a post-op Glenn patient's nasal cannula, despite generous saturations for single ventricle physiology. So let's talk about the respiratory management of a Glenn in the postoperative period. First, we have to review Glenn physiology, a surgery also sometimes called a cavopulmonary anastomosis. The Glenn is the second stage of a single ventricle reconstruction when the superior vena cava, the SVC, is detached from the heart and attached to the pulmonary artery. Blood from the head and upper extremities bypass the heart and flows passively into the lungs. This setup requires low pulmonary artery pressures to work. If the pressure is high, blood won't flow, and the patient will have head swelling and decreased saturations. All patients undergo a cardiac catheterization prior to Glenn to ensure their PA pressure is low enough to accommodate Glenn flow. The problem is, PA pressure would temporarily rise after surgery. Cardiopulmonary bypass and the resulting systemic inflammatory response causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance, and postoperative atelectasis and pulmonary edema will increase PVR. High PA pressures after the gland can cause a few problems. First, it decreases pulmonary blood flow, which will result in cyanosis. Second, back pressure from high SVC pressure can cause decreased cerebral perfusion pressure and a wicked headache. Third, higher venous pressures may contribute to pleural effusions, which can be problematic after the gland. So lowering PA pressure after surgery should help. The first step is to extubate as soon as possible, preferably in the operating room. Positive pressure ventilation increases pulmonary artery pressures and will decrease flow through the gland. Spontaneous breathing creates a negative pressure in the lungs, drawing blood into the pulmonary arteries. But what if you can't extubate because of neurologic, or hemodynamic, or airway reasons? Use the lowest airway pressure you can while still keeping the lungs open. Keep on a higher FiO2, aim for a higher PCO2, and add in inhaled nitric oxide if you are still struggling. We have to talk about the carbon dioxide for a minute. Because we've always been taught that in patients with pulmonary hypertension, we should aim to hyperventilate to lower the CO2. Increased acidosis from CO2 retention increases pulmonary vascular resistance, which is the opposite of the effect we are going for to get blood to flow well through the glen. But a cool study published in 2004 showed that systemic oxygenation was better in glen patients with higher CO2s. Increasing glen patients' CO2 from 35 to 55 improved arterial oxygenation. This is when we need to remember that even though we work in a cardiac ICU, there are a lot of other organs in the body, and our treatments affect more than just the heart. The relevant organ in this case is the brain. The impact of CO2 retention and acidosis is the opposite in the brain compared to the lungs. So while driving the CO2 higher can cause pulmonary vasoconstriction, it causes vasodilation of the cerebral blood vessels. Less resistance to flow to the brain equals more blood flow to the brain more blood coming down the SVC to the pulmonary arteries, more blood being oxygenated, and higher systemic saturations. So if you're having saturation problems with your glen on a ventilator, try driving the CO2 up to 50 and see if that helps. Once extubated, supplemental oxygen acts as a vasodilator. So I think of it more like a medication than a respiratory treatment. I don't know of any studies telling us how much oxygen to use, or honestly, even if supplemental oxygen actually changes outcomes. But it is a low-risk therapy, and I'll do anything to help a baby with a dreaded Glen head. Personally, I keep the babies on two liters overnight their first night after surgery, and then on half a liter until their chest tubes come out. Oh, and pretty much everything I said here applies to the Fontan.